Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Travel. My name is Gary Garnt, coming to you from the place that all women want to hear, my mom's basement in lovely Wisconsin. With me again, as usual, are my partners in crime, the man so nice they named him twice, Mr. Chris Christensen, coming from San Jose Ka. Is that it? That is true. That is true. That's that's where I'm coming from. Not my mother's basement, though. No. Lucky you. Also with us again, as usual, coming from San Diego, which I believe is German for Wales vagina, Jen Leo. Happy summer, everybody. You had, you had to see the movie Anchorman to get the joke, um, which takes place in San Diego. But... That, there was a cultural reference there. It didn't just come out of nowhere. And our guest today, she's National Geographic's Traveler of the Year and also the author of the Volunteer Traveler's Handbook. Welcome back to the show, Shannon O'Donnell. How are you doing, Shannon? Oh, so well. Thank you for having me back. And where are you coming to us from? From Winchester, Virginia, which is my first stop back in the United States um, after traveling from Africa a couple days ago. So we're going to have back-to-back -back Africa episodes. We had Francis Tapon on last time, and uh, we got Shannon on this time. But before we get talking about Africa and other such things, probably want to talk about a couple news stories. Um, Jen, have you been to Hungary? I have, a long time ago. Great baths. Well, you're, you're very lucky to have been there. I've been there, too because I don't know if I'm going anymore, because it is now illegal to take photos without permission in Hungary. Um, I haven't actually Gary, looked at the Gary, law. Are you outraged? I Can't you tell in my face how outraged I am? The outrage, you can't tell, but there's steam coming off my head. Um, this sounds like one of these laws that is going to be there on paper, but I don't know if they're ever going to enforce it in a tourist area like Budapest or something. It, would, it, it just sounds absolutely unenforceable. Um, do you think this is a good idea, and this would this uh, change how you behave if you visited Hungary in any way whatsoever? I no, and I would still take pictures. Idea, I would still take pictures. I, do, what's the background? I'm like, what, what instigated this? There are a lot of countries that are more concerned about privacy than where we live, or, well, where, so, you know, from the U.S., for instance. And there are a lot of different laws that are coming, especially out of Europe these days in the Internet space, that are, um, to us, very strange. But, for instance, in, uh, in the U.S., as you purchase a house, it's a matter of public record, in Germany, for instance, that is just um, unimaginable that how much you paid for a house would be something that anyone else would know. It's just a very different culture. So would you take, uh, is this, would this affect your picture taking, Chris? I might, well, I try not to shoot that many pictures of people anyway. I shoot landscapes, so you know, I'd be more patient, wait for people to walk out of the, out of the frame, perhaps. You know, it was interesting. I got a, I got a little uh, finger-wagging lecture when I was in Charleston uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, I was in the city market, and I was taking picture of a lemonade stand. And the woman in the booth next to her came over and started giving me a reprimand. Uh, I think you should ask me before you take my picture. And I was so caught off guard in the slightest. I was taking picture of the lemonade stand. Uh, not a very good picture, I might add. But it was of the lemonade stand of which we were purchasing a lemonade. So I felt like if I was buying a lemonade, I could take a picture of the woman making it um, without asking. But yeah, it was the woman in the next booth over. So is, is that what's going to be yelling at people who are taking pictures nearby them? I, I, I suspect most pedestrians will walk around in public places with their release forms. I think in Shan, the article when you were in said, Africa. <clears throat> oh, Shan, when you were in Africa, did you take a lot of pictures of people when you visited some is, of the villages and whatnot? <clears throat> absolutely. You know, and you do have to take pictures 
uh, or I mean, ask consent, or at least get the nod from them. Certainly not a release. I cannot imagine doing that, you know, in these villages where they wouldn't understand the release anyways, and you know, it's not in their language. All of these sorts of problems come in when you're an international photographer. But that's sort of telling the story of a place is through the people, um, and you know, in the U.S., being out in public subjects you to being able to have your picture taken, being you know a part of a landscape shot. I mean, that's what you wait for, right? The picture, especially in scenery so shots in Africa, you want the person walking through the picture. I don't know what it would have been like these past few months if I would have had to have considered going up to every person, even if they're in the distance and asking them. I, I don't know. Well, you know, Shit. there's a couple different websites, and I can't think of what they are off the top of my head, where you can take like three shots you did of that landscape and combine them and remove all the people. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> Oh no, that sounds terrible. <laughs> you hey, want to use a pro? Oh. oh, go ahead, Jen. Well, I was just saying, Shannon, I was on your website, a little adrift.com, and I saw this gorgeous picture of this little girl um, in Belize carrying a, a bowl of breads or vegetables or something, and she just has the most glorious smile, and there's great colored uh, buildings and doors behind her. How you didn't ask her for her picture, but how did you get her to smile so jubilantly? She was really happy as she was walking around. Um, you know, she was she was walking on her path, and I saw her, and I did sort of ask her for a moment. Um, I raised my camera, right, and that's the sort of permission. So before I hit click, I I made eye contact with her, and that's when she sort of tilted her head a little bit more and and I took the shot. And so there there was permission there. If she had looked horrified. I wouldn't have taken it. Right. You can tell that she's so happy to be seeing you. Um, yeah. But sometimes uh, photographers take pictures of kids that are just, you know, kind of glassy-eyed and staring off, and, and they just look so serious. Do you think photographers are asking permission before those shots? So that's cultural somewhat too. So yeah. in Africa especially, um, you would have these children with just the best smiles ever and I would go, oh my gosh, I want to capture that. And then you raise the camera and they, they get the stoic face or they pose. And so I was in this rural village in Uganda and that it just kept happening over and over. Every time you raised the camera, the boys would take on a serious posture or like really try to look more manly. Um, and the girls, too, it just, it's, so at some point you gotta you have to hope that the photographer asked, um, but realize that some of that is put on. My son, for the longest time, could not take a good picture because he would get he would smile, but it would be a real fake smile. I think at his senior picture, his mother actually went along with him and told jokes to crack him up. <laughs> so that he had a real smile because he's got a great smile, but you know he would put on a fake smile. I don't, it was a senior picture, but it was one picture that we wanted to have the real Mike smile on. And basically, she she had to get him. She basically went through a series of comedy routines, <laughs> and we got that smile. Oh, and you know, actually, Dan and Audrey from Uncornered Market, I traveled with them in Rwanda and Uganda, and they had just come from Ethiopia, actually. And they said that their tour guide had this hilarious comment that he made about why all of the African children and even some of the adults take the stoic face. Um, and he said, you know, they, they all have sort of agreed, there's this massive agreement in Africa not to take a smiling picture so that everyone thinks that they're poor and will continue sending money. <laughs> I had uh, some really different experiences in Africa. When I was in Benin, we visited this um, village that was on stilts out in the lake, and everybody there, it was the most hostile experience I've ever seen. Everybody had their hands up in their faces, and they don't get a lot of tourists, but I think they just were kind of sick of it after a certain point, and a lot of the people there didn't benefit from tourism. And when I went to Sierra Leone, we went to this one place, and the kids there were just mobbing me to get their picture taken. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and they just, I mean, they could have done that all afternoon was to get their picture taken. They just loved it. And I think it really depends on where you go and uh, the relationship they have with tourists. Uh, when I went up to uh, the Sani Pass in Lestutu, they're used to people coming up there and they know it's an opportunity for them to make money. And so they'll ask for a dollar or two, you know, to get their picture taken. They want to get some money. So it's, 
I think it really depends on where you go and, and how accustomed they are to people with cameras. Well, I think of when I was in Tanzania and we were there actually to visit a church that was caring for orphans for AIDS. And so there were a lot of kids around and it was not a tourism sort of moment. But digital camera where you could take a picture and then show them the picture, you know, that's when they just really wanted, you know, you couldn't take enough pictures at that point because everybody wanted to have their picture taken. Absolutely, yeah. Well, let's move on to another story of another country banning <laughs> where, stuff. Where we're not going. <laughs> uh, now we're going to Russia because uh, our best friend Vladimir Putin has signed a law forcing bloggers and writers to register with a media office. I don't know if this would apply to uh, non-residents or non-citizens or if somebody was just passing through, so if a, like a travel blogger or a travel writer went to Russia, I don't know if they would have to register. Um, I had the impression they would. Did I? I, I don't know. Um, but, Jen, would this dissuade you from maybe going to Russia if you had to register? Uh, well, maybe I could just go and not write about it. The fines... Uh, they say the fines, violators will be fined t between 10,000 and 30,000 rubles, which is roughly $280 to $850. So, not fun. I don't know. You know me. I like getting away with things. I'm sure I would push the envelope there. I mean, it's. It, I, I don't know if... Um, yeah, I don't even know how you'd go about registering, or if you do this when you get your visa or something. Um, here's sort of a more open question. When you visit a country and you have to fill out the immigration form for occupation, do you put down writer or journalist or anything? I put down writer. Really? So I guess you would, I guess going into Russia, I might want to put stay-at-home mom. <laughs> Shannon, what do you put down in the customs form? Uh, often I put consultant. It's really vague in general. <laughs> I put manager. You put manager? Yeah, always put manager. I'm, I manage a website. I man Everybody manages something. So just put manager. doesn't mean anything. But if you put journalist or something down, then that's a huge red flag. And I've learned I don't, I don't say photographer or anything like that. I just... Um, not good, nothing good can come of it. What do and you put down? Ask, are you there for business or are you there for pleasure? Oh, I'm always on holiday. I'm just visiting. <laughs> Which is true. No one is hiring me. That's <laughs> technically true. I mean, I'm not working for anyone else. Australia. Yeah, I have In Australia, you were hired. Not, but even then, it's not like you're working for a company in the country, like you're taking a job from someone. So it's not the same thing, which is really what they care about in most cases. And the journalist thing, they're just worried about, especially some countries, if you go to the EU, they don't, they don't care. They don't even have a form to ask you to fill out. But some countries, I think they're worried about someone coming in and doing investigative reporting or something like that, and that's what raises the flag, uh, that it could cause political issues. Well, and that was the case in the... Russian with the bloggers law, you had to have a following of more than 3,000 people. So if you're writing something that only your family's reading, they don't care. I'd love to see the department in charge of policing this. Well, that's why I would say, do I have a website? And I'd say, yeah, and I'd show my personal website, which has an audience of much less than 3,000 people. So <laughs> they need to know about the other one. Uh, let's talk about one more story of another country that this time they don't want to well, I guess suppose they do want to ban something, but they actually kind of want to add something. The Spanish <laughs> island of Mallorca wants to ban bikinis because, doggone it, the, the, the residents are just sick of people walking around showing all this skin. Um, they're not actually thinking of, like, banning this on the beach, are they? No, or is it just like in restaurants? It's, or, yeah. it's just that you shouldn't only wear your beachwear at the beach. Which That's is culturally appropriate is in a lot of places, but uh, you know, not where not where Jen lives down in San Diego, where you know beach wear is considered formal wear. But <laughs> uh, I'm laughing because the quote that they used 
uh, the quote says, I've lived on Mallorca for the past 11 years, and it makes my skin crawl when I have to stand behind some fat, sweaty individual in the supermarket who thinks it's okay to let it all hang out. Now, that's, well, see, there's some great journalism there. That is the, uh, that is the thing. Is when you've been to some of those beaches, well, I haven't been to Mallorca, but when you've been to some of the Spanish beaches, for instance, I remember being surprised just who would wear a bikini and how few of the portions of it they might actually wear. You know, it's one of those grandma's got a new bikini. I wish she would wear all of it sort of moments. So, grandma. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think no shirts, no shoes, no service should you know apply. I I, I am not opposed to a ban like this at all. I will say this, there are definite cultural differences, more with men than with women, between Europeans and Americans and what they want to wear at the beach. Uh, most American men would probably wear, you know, a longer swimsuit or something, um, whereas European men are going to bust out the Speedo, um, regardless of how much body hair or body mass they may have, they're completely unashamed and that's just out there. We have a friend who went to... Uh to France on a business trip and he brought his swimsuit because there was a pool at the hotel and he went to go down in the pool and they would not let him get in the pool because that was not a swimsuit. He had to go buy the Speedo because they would not believe him that he was wearing a swimsuit. They, they literally thought he was wearing shorts or underpants or something like that because an American style swimsuit the person at the hotel did not believe was a swimsuit. Uh. That's the French for you. <laughs> uh, let's talk about one more thing, and this probably just deserves a mention. Uh, friend of the show, Spud Hilton, has started a campaign on Twitter. He has a, a new hashtag called Carry On Shame, where he wants to publicly shame people who are bringing too much on board their flights uh, as their carry-on baggage. Now, as you know, the airlines have a little, you know, box set up before you get on the plane says your carry-on must fit in this space. And then there are people that bring on stuff that just doesn't fit in the overhead bin and then they bring a duffel bag on top of that and a purse and everything. And there are people that are really violating the rules which may make it difficult for everyone else. And then the airlines really aren't enforcing this either. Um, have you guys seen anything super egregious lately in terms of uh, carry-ons? And would you publicly shame someone that you were on a flight with? by taking the picture of their bag and posting on Twitter. Well, certainly not in Hungary. I wouldn't. <laughs> well, we have to we More have to know we have to note that all the pictures so far on hashtag carry on shame are taken from the back. So there are no shots of people with their faces and also the bags. But I do love this. I think it's fantastic and uh, just perfect for Spud's sense of humor. Um, and now, Gary, you didn't mention that there's a picture of a guy with complete plumber's butt measuring his bag that is too big for the carry-on bag uh, in the measurement when it says must fit in this box. So it's kind of like his bag doesn't fit in the box and his butt don't fit in the jeans. <laughs> it's funny. Actually, one of the things you said, Gary, that I'm finding is not the case that much anymore is I'm finding a number of airlines are starting to crack down on when, and that was nothing real related to the plumber's comment there, with um, carry-ons, especially with the width of it. So my bag does fit in the overhead bin, but I was stopped by American. I couldn't even get through security because they said you have to put it in there, and it's it's wider than the nine inches that they allow. And it, I've carried it for you, you know, years, and it does fit in the overhead bin, but they said, nope, it is it is too big. And Delta also, somebody else we know, I can't think of who it was, ran into the same thing with Delta recently. So I think what they're basically doing is they're trying to squeeze, you know, a little more money from the, the check luggage, but basically they said you have you have to check it when I went, uh, went to Jordan recently. Shannon, are you nasty enough person to publicly shame someone on a flight? I mean, I think you know the answer to that. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I would, I would maybe take the picture and like DM it to you know to Spud, but I I don't think I could do it. <laughs> just it oh, just come seems. On. Oh, I know, but it just I don't know. They don't want to pay money, you know. Like I get it when the airline fees are still recent enough in everybody's memory that we used to be able to have this like free for all where you could just check all kinds of bags, and so. 
to some extent, I said, I kind of get it. We're still trying to change the culture and say, you know, be appropriate. I, I don't know. That's me trying to justify just being overly nice. Maybe I should be a Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> My bags are always <laughs> fine. But then after security, I wind up buying the extra bags from the gift shops and the food stores. So on occasion, I could be questioned, but I don't think I would be worthy of a photo because, you know, my other stuff is normal size. Okay, before we move on, I just want to tell you all a Canadian knock-knock joke. Knock-knock. <laughs> Who's there? there? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to have bothered you. <laughs> So Shannon O'Donnell's with us. Last time we had you on the show, you were talking about your book, uh, The Volunteer Traveler's Handbook. Since then, uh, kind of big stuff, you were named National Geographic's Traveler of the Year, which is pretty impressive. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that happened and, and what has happened to you uh, since they've, they've come out with the announcement and, and how this has kind of changed your life, your business, your website, and everything else. Ah, so last July, I got an email that said, um, you know, I had been nominated for their Travelers of the Year program and selected. The Travelers of the Year program focuses on people who are traveling with passion and purpose, and so that can mean a lot of different things, but um, for me, it was for my grassroots volunteering and my work um, promoting social enterprise and tourism that sort of is like community-based, sustainable, local, that all of those words that aren't very trendy, you know, and we're trying to catch on but basically are encapsulated by grassroots travel. People helping at the local level in the places um, that they visit. And that's what I'm passionate about, the type of travel I love doing, the type of travel that I wish more people um, would know about and do. And so National Geographic liked the work that I had been doing and made me Traveler of the Year. And I will admit I did a massive happy dance um, in my house. It was, <laughs> it was uh, you know, probably very embarrassing if anyone had seen it, but no one did. And so <laughs> Uh, since then, you know, NPR had me on to talk about social enterprise, which again, basically I went down the list of everything that my dad had always valued in life, so National Geographic, um, NPR, these are the things he loves, and I was able to say, look, Dad, I'm doing good things. <laughs> You know, surprisingly enough, my parents didn't really pay any attention to what I was doing until I was in the Appleton Post Crescent, and then <laughs> suddenly it became like... It justified everything because then it was Time big... magazine. Forget it. <laughs> so hey, Society of American Shannon. Travel writing who, but that's one you can show the neighbors. Mm -hmm. Shannon, yeah. what's the best way for travelers to find uh, the kind of sustainable travel options that you're talking about? Oh, that that's so promoting? funny. You should ask. I actually, they're really hard to find because it's it's a newer style of travel, like this sort of socially conscious. And so part of my grassrootsvolunteering.org website has long-term volunteer opportunities, but then also because I don't believe that everybody, that every trip is right for every person to volunteer, a whole other part of the database is geolocated businesses that other travelers are helping me map the world. And we're mapping the world of these locally run organizations that are addressing social issues on their own terms. So normally they're, they're not, you know, multinational corporations. It's not even often government run. It's really the local small boutiques or massage parlors or anything that's giving back in a socially conscious way. A few years ago I reviewed a site which I thought was called Whole Travel and it broke down the sustainability of each of the different lodges, lodging options um, for cities around the world and I just did a quick search while we were talking about this and I can't find it anymore so I'll have to do a deeper search looking through my reviews to see what it was but if it's still, I, I can't believe I couldn't find it but uh, have you ever heard of a site like that whole, whole travel? I haven't but I know that one of the, the biggest sectors for that type of travel like eco lodges and those have taken off, and that is something that a lot of people identify with socially conscious travel is they go, oh, well, I'm going to go to an eco-lodge, which mm -hmm. is great. And they have networks, and, you know, I would love to get that, that link and look further into it. But it's some of the smaller organizations and maybe restaurants that anybody could add into their trip. Like, you can stay at the Hilton or the Marriott if you want and still add a socially conscious element because there are some like massive number percentage like upwards of 90% of your tourism dollars don't stay in the place that you visit 
um, for a lot of people. For the budget backpackers, like maybe not, but for most tourists who are going on vacation, that money doesn't even stay within the country helping the people who you're, you know, visiting. Well, I remember what was, uh, when I was in uh, Jordan, I stayed in an Echo Lodge there, and one of the things that was cool about it was that they had really an association with the local Bedouin community, and my guide that took me out, for instance, to an archaeological site was one of the local community who is now working at the Echo Lodge, and he said about half the money was staying in the local community, and because of that, there was, you know, a lot more support for what was going on there, so we went, you know, down the hill and, and talked to people as we were going through the, through the, I'm going to say the village, but it's a Bedouin community, so it's, you know, through the tents and, and such, but uh, it is interesting how much that is not the case in so many places. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's because to get the Western standard. So there's mm -hmm. a gap for a lot of places where it's just easier. You know that the hygiene standards at a restaurant run by, you know, foreigners is, is perhaps going to have the hygiene standards you're used to and you're not going to get sick. And so there's a safety element to a lot of people just not venturing very far into more of the community-based organizations or even the local markets or things like that in the developing world. But... You know, with grassroots volunteering, it's sort of, I try to fill in between. So all money going back into local is good, but with the social enterprises, it's businesses that maybe have a little bit more of a foundation behind them that are, you know, good to support. It's You're probably not going to get sick of the restaurants in the, the database, no promises, <laughs> but um, probably not. And, you know, the tourism operators are fairly well established, and all of it, though, is community run. What were some of the uh, the volunteer or the the projects you visited when you were in Africa? Oh. I know that I was talking to you about several of the ones that you had visited. Why don't you give a, a breakdown of some of the different ones you saw in some of the different places and uh, how you found them being run and whatever your thoughts are. So one of my favorites is um, a Maasai community. So. The images that we have in the Maasai Warrior, right, they're super interesting. That's something everybody kind of wants to add into perhaps their safari or their their trip, basically, to East Africa. And a lot of safaris will include maybe like a 20-minute cultural tour. So you visit a Maasai village and you call it a day. But those aren't really respecting the Maasai community. Like, it's a paycheck for them. They need money. Tourists are there, so they go do it. And so this one called Majimoto, which is in Kenya, and it's right near the Maasai Mara in Kenya, uh, runs a cultural camp. They have huts that are beautiful. They're sort of in the same style as their manadas, their little villages with the mud, but inside it's it's been, you know, taken up, up a comfort level, um, perhaps if you don't want to sleep on a sage bed or some such like that. So there's there's mattresses, there's those sorts of things. But the money from the cultural projects, so you live in the Maasai village, um, staying at least a couple days is best. And what the chief has done is he saw the opportunity and this interest that people have. And so to take it on his own terms, he brings you in and people can come into the Maasai cultural camp knowing that you're there with your cameras and your questions, but the money is going to, fu to fund a widow's village. And the widow's village is a group of women who have lost their husbands. But even beyond that, those women have one hut within it where a, bun a lot of girls stay. And these girls have, some of them walked for three or four days from Tanzania, from all over the region of the Maasai community there that spans all the countries. And they're escaping female circumcision. And he's become a leader in talking against genital circumcision for females and early marriages at like 13 because that's about when they get circumcised. And so he's used the funds from this cultural camp to continue raising awareness and to support these girls. And that's the kind of project where I say no foreigner is a part of it. It is completely an issue that he saw within his own community and came up with a solution that we can help support only through tourism dollars. They don't need you to volunteer, they just need your money. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. When I was in uh, Tanzania, we visited the, the Maasai, so M-A-A-S-A-E school, which is largely Maasai, but the law in Tanzania is that you can't have any sort of program that is aimed at only one tribe. So it's mostly to the Maasai and the other pastoral tribes, but it's basically a girls' school. And we, you know, spent some time there. Now I've had friends who have gone back and taught for, you know, periods of time there or helped out with the computer lab or whatever. But it's, again, that sort of thing that, not only does that pull 
girls into that situation, sometimes out of a arranged marriage or whatever, with the support usually of the chief of the village uh, quite often. Uh, because they are seeing the benefits of having the girls educated. They're coming back as teachers. They're coming back even in a couple cases as doctors and things like that. So uh, there are benefits to the community. And, um, and one of the things that is changing is the cultural acceptance. For instance, you talked about the female circumcision. It's amazing how in a, a generation that has gone from just completely the norm to now less than half. I don't remember what the last number I've seen is, but it's it's changing fairly rapidly. And I think that some of this sort of thing of, you know, educating the girls and bringing them out and then but then sending them back too, not you know, not removing them from their culture but um, sort of combining their culture with some education has been interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, did you get to any other projects while you're in Africa? Yes. So actually, the following week, I visited another one. And this this is on the volunteering side. So it was from one side to the other of what I sort of support. And um, there's a name, a guy named Dan Ogolo. And he was raised in a rural part of Kenya on the border with Uganda. And as he got adulthood, he so his mother, he had a brother who died. And he had um, a lot of struggles. And it's one of the poorest regions of Kenya. So he went to Nairobi. And as many people who dream of the big city find, he ended up in the Kaibara slum which is an, a massive slum um, in Nairobi. And from there, he saw a lot of people fall into drugs and alcohol. And he decided that the, to stop some of that would be to go back into his community and create a region and a life for people that would never make them want to leave Nairobi. So to better his own community and make it a, a quality place to live so that the men never left. And so what he started with was health. And so he founded Madi Babu, a clinic, and now there's a nursing school that's opening in um, September. And they have a lot of um, international help that's funded some of their projects. But he accepts long-term volunteers. And doctors have come from, a lot of them actually from California, um, in the San Francisco and Sacramento area come. And they share their skills, and they train the local doctors. And, we're, and they have managed to see massive, massive decreases in um, you know, the, the number of child's death and maternal deaths and maternal and child health is a really big factor for them. And so the work he's doing has just made an incredible difference um, by adding a single hospital to a community and education and clinics and um, community outreach. And so it was really inspiring to see the work that he's doing. And, and they also need agricultural volunteers because he founded a women's school, just like you were saying with the Maasai, but this is for mm -hmm. rural girls to, you know, stay in school, even if they've had a child, to have a support network there to be able to continue to go to school and part of that project is agriculture you know growing the food that they're going to feed the girls at this school and so there's lots of different volunteers I haven't entered it on grassroots volunteering yet but his work has been it was incredible to see and they invited me into their into their home and their community for a week and it was incredible Wow <clears throat> We didn't do any of this stuff. We just went to Victoria Falls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, which was also incredible in the true sense of the word. It was, it was like, wow, beautiful. So uh, last week we had Francis Tap on on the show, and he's spending four years in Africa. And a lot of what we talked about were comparing the things that I saw in Africa versus what he saw in Africa. What were some of the things that you've, you've spent several months there now that you came away with? What did you learn and, and what are your thoughts on the place? So I had a crisis at some point um, of the work that I'm doing. So I'm on here talking about volunteering and social enterprise and all of this. And when I got to East Africa, I went, oh my god, look at what we did. Like We broke this place. Because the humanitarian and the aid work in Africa is startling. And the locals who are educated are super cynical about um, even the UN or organizations that we take as doing some of the bulk of the good in the world, of the positive development and you know humanitarian work. And the locals just see the effects that poor aid work has done. And and it just it caused a crisis in me where I said, well, look at all these organizations that um, have thought that they were doing really good for years, and then, you know, 10 years later we go, oh, that's not a really positive way to interact. It's causing dependency. Let's switch it. And so it was really startling to see what decades of just switching policies has done. Yeah. What's an example of uh, poor aid work? 
Did so you... I won't name, you know, no, no, no naming of organizations specifically. No, but... no, just, just some, tell me something that didn't work that a local would be upset about. The dependency created. So aid that comes in and hands out or comes up with mm -hmm. a solution that they think is going to work or it works in a single community and then they raise, you know, a hundred thousand, a million dollars, and they get all of this funding come in, and they blanket spread it across an area. And what you end up with is something that worked at a small scale in one community doesn't work in every community. The needs are different, and so you end up with broken humanitarian projects, like playgrounds that fund this, or wells that are no longer working, all of these things that we thought were really great ideas. And we came in and we said, we're going to change your world, <laughs> you know, and then we, and then we left with them with something that doesn't work and that that money, that hundred thousand or whatever could have been better invested in another way perhaps and that's what we're seeing now is that after a couple decades of just willy-nilly allowing people to go in there and fundraise without a consciousness of what's the long-term effect of this, what they've seen is that educated people in the region are saying, well, I see what it does is there's, you, you guys are associated with bank accounts. You come in and you throw around money and no wonder that our children run up to you saying, give me money, give me money, which is what I heard echoed across Rwanda. There was a and I, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned last week I didn't hmm. see a single beggar in West Africa hmm. because they get so little tourism and there are so few Westerners that bother to go there that no one has ever made that association yet. Well, There's and that's, a... that's the thing is the tourists. So there are not so many tourists in East Africa. There certainly are the high-end luxury tourists. But mm -hmm. what shocked me is that as a solo backpacker, I met Peace Corps workers, and I met you know people who worked for all the various NGOs, and very, very few people like me who were just independently exploring the region. So most of the people in that area are developing, you know, are, are involved in development and aid work. There's a TED Talk, and I'll look to see if I can find a link that's uh, from somebody who went to Africa with, I think it's the British equivalent of the Peace Corps, and I can't think what the name of that program is. And he said, you know, he worked on a couple of different things that worked. They were just massive failures, and he said kind of the secret there is that everybody thinks it's just their project. And as, as you look back, there's a lot of sort of, and nobody wants to talk about the ones that fail, and the one that he cited was there's this beautiful valley and they're like well, why don't you have agriculture in this valley and so they plant all these crops and you know they're thinking you know why we're much smarter we we plant the crops here and then the hippos come and eat all the crops and they're like oh yeah the hippos do that <laughs> and it's just you know <laughs> just not even involving the locals the local knowledge in so many cases just not even just what the locals really need but also just not even asking, well, why don't you grow crops in this valley? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, there's hippos. <laughs> so, you know, some pretty obviously dumb things have been done. Uh, just leaving the Africans out of the African question, I think, has been the big problem. Mm -hmm. I, ha I had an opposite reaction. Of course, you know, I haven't been to Eastern Africa, but I, I just got back from Costa Rica, where even though I was in heavily touristed areas, I was overwhelmed with the impression of how how much more simply they live, mm -hmm. and I was uh, we were at this farm that was uh, over a hundred years old, and the grandfather who had um, bought the farm for about two dollars over a hundred years ago, about a hundred and five years ago, he had recently passed away uh, about five five weeks earlier than we had gotten there, and they told us that the city came together for uh, his 100th birthday and ran electricity out to his farm. And when they asked, when they told him this big gesture that they wanted to do this for him, at first he turned it down and said, no, 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 we don't need it. Uh, but his grandson talked him out of it and said, no, 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 we'll have a few lights for you run the, run the electricity. <laughs> but as we were in, in their home, just they were there to, it was a it was a little stop off for food on this uh, river safari that we were doing. But we were speaking in Spanish together with um, his daughter. She was taken by Cora and I guess myself because I was speaking Spanish to her. Um, and she invited us to go see his, his bedroom. So we left the tourist area and walked through their kitchen, which was just dirt floor and little baby chicks running around and invited into his tiny, tiny back room. Um, where he used to listen to his soccer games. And I just came back thinking, oh my gosh, I, 
we have too much stuff. Not mm. how do I fix you and give you internet, but how do I get rid of my stuff? That, I don't know. I guess there's different ways of looking at it, but I'm still in that after period of thinking we have too much stuff. I live out of a bag. <laughs> I need yes, more than a bag, but I don't need Does it fit in the carry-on container? That's really the question there, Gary. <laughs> um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but there was a movie that came out last year with Steve Carell called The Incredible Burt Wonderstone. Mm-hmm. And his assistant is a musician named Steve Buscemi, and he quits and he goes to a developing country because he wants to help kids, so he gives them all magic kits. And then later in the movie, he's like, well, it turns out they really wanted food. <laughs> 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 oh no! But he was doing he was doing what felt good for him, but not obviously for the kids. And it's not a great film, but I thought that sort of scene was kind of poignant. Mm-hmm. Good job, Gary. Thanks. <laughs> Just wanted to put that in there. Uh, anything else about Africa you want to tell us, Shannon? Oh, that's all I have right now. Unless you guys have any other questions. Chris, favorite food. Um, Ugali. <laughs> Ugali. I was told, actually, that if, when I returned to Kenya, the rural village I visited, Ugenya, which is um, the visit where Mari Babu, the clinic I talked about, was. So there, I got to know a bunch of the doctors. But anyway, what they said is that if I learn how to make Ugali, I will have a marriage proposal waiting for me when I get back. <laughs> Great. And for Shannon, those know, Ugali is like a, a cornmeal porridge. It's probably the closest thing, and then you eat it with a little meat on it if you can get it. Yeah. But it's a very much a staple in East Africa. Absolutely. Shannon, how did you keep in touch with people back home? Uh, what kind of internet was there, or were there international phone booths? What's the options? What are your What are your communication options out there? A lot of the hostels had internet, so. I was able to to do that. I also had 3G, so I bought a SIM card in every country. It was a dollar for the SIM card and about between seven and fifteen dollars a gig. In Tanzania, I think it was fifteen dollars for five gigs um, that last between a month and three months. So the 3G actually, I have a client that I talk to every week. It worked beautifully almost everywhere. Terrific. Mm-hmm. We say talk to when I was there, and uh, this is a number of years ago now. I was trying to use Skype. And it, there were, well, it, to be technical, there were packet drops. I mean, you really couldn't use Skype. There were three to six second delays and echoes, and it just really, the Internet at that time, and this got to be ten years ago, nine years ago, eight years ago. I'm not sure exactly how long ago. Has it gotten better since then? So the, the Internet, probably not. But as I think, you know, there are all these articles about the mobile technology in Africa. Mobile technology... Incredible. So if you can get a SIM card, it's actually stronger most of the time. Throughout Rwanda, um, internet was a lot more scarce, so I hotspotted my iPhone, and Mm -hmm. it worked faster sometimes than my internet in the U.S. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, then. Want to move on to our picks of the week? Well, I was going to... This is harder when we do this every week rather than when we do it every month. (laughs) We should... I was going to tease uh, the amateur crossover listeners with a Charleston restaurant review since uh, I'm going to be doing a Charleston show with Chris soon. But Shannon got me all excited about volunteer stuff, and maybe, Shannon, you could help me and tell me if this is a good organization. I have a lot of friends who have teenagers now, and so they are looking for... um, programs where teens can do volunteering uh, programs abroad for summer camp. So I found a website called Global Leadership Adventures. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with them? Are they reputable? I feel like they are. Um, So let me look at their website, but... um... Yeah, they, I mean, they've got a video of Obama endorsing them, I don't, and and the accredited uh, Business Bureau stamp and uh, they have a lot of press on them as well but it's called uh, experiencegla.com for the global global leadership adventures and uh, they've got programs all over the world where teens can have volunteer experiences as well as uh, leadership workshops 
as long as we're doing volunteer groups, actually the group that I have worked with more than any other is right in Jen's backyard, and that is Esperanza. Esperanza International is a group in Tijuana and now also in Oaxaca. And they basically are looking to build community, and they do something like, um, oh, the group that Jimmy Carter was involved with. I'm just getting a, a complete brain fart here. Uh, where Habitat you for Habitat for Humanity. Habitat, yeah. So like Habitat, Jinx, you have to build up a sweat equity. Um, and so when when volunteers come and help build a house, basically, they get to the work site and all of the bricks for the house have been made by the family, usually by the women uh, the, in the local neighborhood because the man is off uh, working and so they've made all the bricks and then they'll get a volunteer group together that'll be a school or a church or something like that will come and help you know, build the walls or pour the foundation or something like that. So I've been down about 15 times to uh, Tijuana with Esperanza International, wonderful group of people down there. Not a, not a big group. I mean, we're, we're not talking about a major um, organization here. I think they're probably, you know, five employees total or something like that. Well, if you guys are going to pick volunteering picks of the week, I'm kind of guilted into doing it. <laughs> I was going to do the White Billionaires Club, um, <laughs> but I'll do something else. Uh, when I was in Sierra Leone, we visited a place called uh, John Obe Beach, and it was run by this group called Tribe Wanted. And I had heard of them before on CNN. Uh, they had initially started a project in Fiji several years ago. And what they're trying to do is to build sustainable, uh, community-driven holiday destinations where people can go visit. And you can buy a mm. lifetime membership for like a 1,000 pounds, I think. That gives you five nights every year in uh, one of the destinations, and there are currently three of them. There's one in Sierra Leone that I that we visited, uh, there's one in Mozambique, and there's one in, of all places, Italy. Um, but these are not high-end, they're very, you know, uh, I would say hostile level type destinations, um, but they try to keep, they hire locals for everything, they try to keep all the money uh, that they raised into the location, and uh, all the food is locally sourced and everything, but they're trying to uh, create different ones of these around the world. And it goes back to what Shannon was talking about, but just being able to visit a place and making sure that all of your money basically stays in the community. Uh, so you can find it at tribewanted.com. They have a rather nice website. And uh, like I said, they have these three locations. And quite frankly, if you're interested in visiting Sierra Leone, and I don't know if anybody is, uh, but it would actually be a rather nice place to stay. It's it's reasonably close to Freetown. It is right on the beach, like right, right on the beach, and it's a nice beach, and there's really nothing else around it. And um, I, I remember when we were there that some of the, the people on the ship with me actually had, uh, they bought a lobster from one of the local fishermen for like 10 bucks, and uh, so they cooked it up, and they had lobster for lunch, <laughs> and uh, it was pretty cool. Actually, on a volunteer theme, uh, if you're interested in Sierra Leone, we did an episode of Amateur Traveler with Chris Gillibo from the Art of Nonconformity and the um, World Domination Summit. His first trip traveling was uh, he did a volunteer stint for, I think, two years with Mercy Ships. And Mercy Ships had a ship that was stationed while he was there half the time in Sierra Leone. And basically, it's a hospital ship. And they do a lot of reconstructive surgery and those sort of things is one of the things they specialize in. But So his experience in Sierra Leone, as he came on the show and talked about it, was a volunteer trip, uh, volunteer tourism experience. So check that out. Hey, Jen, is this your first time in the Amateur Traveler? Yes. Uh, if we once we record it, once we finally do it, we've been talking about this for over a, well since over before a year. I went to Charleston, and I went to Charleston I think in 2012. So oh, that's that's really cute. <laughs> 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 I have stage fright. Shannon, Shannon, you got a tip for us this week? Yeah. So I already talked about them, but they are my tip because what I counted among the best experiences I have I've had in you know in my travels was the Majimoto Cultural Camp. Um, learning about the Maasai and supporting their work. If you Google it, um, the New York Times did a really beautiful piece, beautiful photographs um, about um, Salaton and the work that he's doing with the widow's village and the girls and that sort of thing. So 
I would recommend that if you plan a safari to East Africa that you stop in Kenya at the Majimoto Cultural Camp. And they're super child friendly as well. They will teach your boys how to like throw spears like a Maasai warrior and who wouldn't want that? <laughs> Can you spell it for us, Shannon? Yeah, so it's M-A-J-I-M-O-T-O -O, and then the cultural camp. And that means hot water because they are really fortunate to be right on a hot water stream. So while you're at the cultural camp, you will actually take beautiful beautifully hot showers. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> you know, I should give one other tip, and, and Shannon knows about this. You know, we talk about tech sometimes on the show. We talk about politics or, or culture, but we don't talk about investment opportunities. And I just want to say, invest in Zimbabwe <laughs> dollars, because <laughs> let me tell you, 50 million dollars <laughs> Lots of money there, ladies and gentlemen. Fifty million. They were giving this stuff away like it was nothing. These people don't know what they're doing. Fifty million bucks. I took as much as I can. On paper, I am now a billionaire. And how much will fifty million Zimbabwe dollars buy you these days? Chris, it's not about that. <laughs> it's about having millions of dollars. You gotta change your way of thinking there. Fifty million is more than one, so <laughs> it's better than one. All right, then, uh, why don't we start to wrap things up. Chris, what's new in the Amateur Traveler this week? Uh, we just actually did an episode uh, where I was the guest, talking about uh, Jordan, talking about my trip to Jordan. So Who interviewed you? I interviewed myself. I have uh, occasionally uh, <laughs> brought somebody else on for those trips. But there's this one there's medication for that, Chris. Yes. <laughs> I ask myself the hard questions, though, so that's really that's really what you need. I think you should have been out in a park bench doing it and just, like, <laughs> asking the questions beforehand and then put it in your ear and then answer them all while you're just talking to yourself uh, would have been highly entertaining. You know, when you wear earbuds, you can get away with talking to yourself all the time. All right. Well, yeah, since, I, since I got uh, chastised for not promoting WebBuzz enough, uh, I will let you know that this weekend's web buzz was on the winerist, winerist.com, which wants to take you away from wine package tours and steer you more towards um, handcrafted wine experiences. And they specialize in European destinations. Um, and they have a section, a wonderful section on wine hotels. So whether you like to drink wine or not, there's some really, really beautiful landscapes on the winerist.com. It's very ironic that you bring that up because uh, there's a site I was going to mention that instead of focusing on packaged sausage tours in Europe, uh, it's called the Wienerist, and uh, it helps people find boutique sausages, sausage makers, and do sausage tastings all throughout Europe. Uh, bratwurst, uh, everything. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And that's the Wienerist.com. Well, that's much better than the family travel site, the Winerist, but... Uh, <laughs> Sure is great to have you back, Gary. Love to see you in a good mood. <laughs> oh, of course. And Shannon, where can people find you online? So my travel website is a littleadrift.com, and then I've talked about grassrootsvolunteering.org, which has that database of social enterprises and long-term volunteering opportunities all over the world. And you also want to tell people about your work with Halberton and Exxon? Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. And as usual, you can you can find me on the internet. Uh, I think this week I'll be promoting the Instagram account, which is Instagram.com slash Everything Everywhere. I've uh, been doing a lot there lately. And uh, any anything else before we adjourn? Uh, your silence is consent. So until next time, get outside. Once again, explore the continent of Africa and do something to help a local community. <laughs>